Welcome fellow freaks, geeks, and nostalgic peeps to my channel, Slime and Slashers, where, yeah, we talk about everything from Nickelodeon slime to horror movie slashers, but plenty of stuff in between, including books. And yes, today we are talking books once again. But we're not talking about any old freaking books. We are talking about the trashiest, the zaniest, the most craziest books that have been dragged up from the pits of paperback. <laughs> Yes, we will be counting down my top 20 favorite trashiest paperback from hell reads that I think would be perfect for you to read for Garbogist. Don't worry if you don't know what Garbogist is, I will explain that. But let's go to the short intro and when we come back, we'll get into all the deets and the top 20 list. Dun 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 dun! dun. Hell reigns from above and below because we are entering the paperback from hell realm. <laughs> Welcome back, guys. I have emerged from the pits of hell to talk about what I found down there in those pits. I found some great, trashy, awesome horror vintage reads, specifically books that I consider to be paperbacks from hell. I'll explain what I mean by that term in case you're unfamiliar in a second, but first let me explain what Garb August is. Garb August is a month-long celebration of, quote, trash. And of course we mean trash with love and with respect because we're really talking about zany, crazy things. I think trash can apply to books that may feel a little bit campy, books that may read almost like a B-movie but in book form. And Garbogus was created by the wonderful, marvelous, freaking awesome badass Ali over at the channel Criminali. Make sure you subscribe to him and check him out. Like I said, he's the creator and I am a co-host this year along with so many wonderful other co-hosts. So I will link everybody below, but I am personally very honored to be freaking swimming in the trash officially as a co-host for Garbogus. So it is awesome. So why I am making this top 20 list as a specific recommendation video for anyone participating in Garb August is because there's actually optional themed weeks every week and the second week the possible themes again the optional themes are paperbacks from hell or vintage smut and week two takes place from August 7th through August 13th 2023 of course and then week four though it says anything goes so the last 10 days from August 21st to the 31st you could literally read anything which includes you could technically read more paperbacks from hell. So paperbacks from hell are something that's being highlighted as a part of Garb August, and that is why I'm making this specific top 20 video of my favorite wackiest, trashiest paperback from hell reads that I've read since I started reading just about two and a half, three years ago. I try to read a lot of vintage books, not a lot of people do, but I do, and I freaking love paperbacks from hell. So where does that term come from? Well, that term got popular after the nonfiction book by Grady Hendrix called Paperbacks from Hell was released not too long ago. And of course I read this and this is what catapulted me into vintage horror. This is a great resource if you've never ever picked it up. Some people just call books that have been mentioned within this book or shown within this book to be paperbacks from hell. When I consider something a paperback from hell, I kind of do a larger umbrella than just what this book covers. I really mean any paperback that's not really very popular in terms of it wasn't written by Stephen King, it wasn't written by Anne Rice, it wasn't written by Dean Koontz. Any old school horror paperback from the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s because there were some crazy vintage horror books from the 90s as well. But yeah, Grady Hendrix does not mention every old school paperback ever in this book. So, you know, just because I mentioned it on my top whatever list doesn't mean that it was actually mentioned in the book, but it probably was. I do want to give a special shout out to one of my favorite people on earth, Alex. She's over at the channel The Bookubus. Please, please check her out if you love vintage horror or if you're looking to get more into vintage horror because in my opinion, she is the queen. And I was trying to do like a crown thing, but I did this. She is the queen of vintage horror. And her channel is just amazing for finding old school recommendations. She actually just gave her 
paperback from hell recommendations for garb august just a few days ago so i will link her video below because guess what i think we only have one book in common which is pretty awesome considering we both read a lot of vintage horror but we didn't have a lot intersecting on our top lists so she's got a whole other list of recommendations for you if you want even more after you watch my list and you haven't seen hers i highly advise subscribing to her and to check out her recommendation video because it is fantastic Honestly, this list is in no particular order. I did not rank them per se. I just kind of made a list of 20 books that came to mind that were considered paperbacks from hell in my mind in terms of they are from the 70s, 80s, or 90s, and they are wacky, zany, crazy, perfect top tier trash for Garb August. First up, we have Moonbane by Al Sarantonio. This is actually one you can find a Kindle edition and an audiobook of, which is rare for old books. So I would take advantage of that if you are an audiobook reader. And this is wild. Obviously, if you take a close look at the paperback, you could see we've got a werewolf situation and somebody's going to the moon. Did the werewolves come from the moon? Why are people going to the moon? This one, short, quick, ridiculous, easy to read, a lot of fun. And it's not the greatest paperback I've ever read. There are some slow parts, but overall, the premise is what you want to read this for. And I thought the ending was really well worth the time I spent to read the entire book. So yeah, I, I do recommend it. And it is quite an interesting story in terms of it's just very unique. Next up, we've got The Breeze Horror by Candace Caponegro. And this looks like, from the cover, that this book is about haunted curtains or haunted window panes. No, no, no. You would be wrong if you think that. I mean, the, the cover is kind of a menacing looking curtain, but that is not what this is about. This is a zombie story, but this is a different kind of zombie story. And if you don't have a vintage copy, have no fear because this also has a Kindle version and you could read it. It has a cool new cover, not as cool as this one, but it's still kind of cool for being like a new design for the Kindle copy. And yeah, I'd advise checking it out because it's easy to read. Not every vintage book that is rare like this one has a Kindle copy, so take advantage when you can. And this one, we open up right away with like an Ozzy Osbourne-esque scene where some dude bites the head off of a freaking bird. Yes. And then we've got zombies who are able to do more supernatural, magical things than normal zombies usually do in stories. So I think for the different take on zombies alone, this is worth it. And I do want to preface all of these book recommendations by saying vintage horror will not be for everyone. There will be some things that are outdated. There will be some problematic language, most likely, or, you know, s sexual content or just problematic representation, etc, etc. It is not for everyone. You have to go in knowing that this was written at a different time, and if you're not cool with that, I would just avoid it, and I would always try to look up trigger warnings as well in case you're worried, but still want to possibly try out reading these older books, but yeah, be careful because they won't be for everybody. Next up, a book I've talked about quite a lot on my channel, so if you are a longtime viewer, you're probably sick of me talking about this over and over again, but I'm going to talk about it again, bitch, because this book is freaking badass, and I do think it's a great book to dip your toe into the horror realm if you're not too squeamish, if you don't mind bleak things and disturbing things, because this book is full of those types of things. But this is Book of the Damned by D.A. Fowler, a.k.a. Deborah Fowler, as well. This is a new edition, so there is a new edition of this book. The old edition looks pretty darn cool in my opinion too so if you happen to frequent used bookstores definitely keep an eye out because Deborah Fowler's books they have really cool covers but yeah I'm so glad that her books are being reprinted shout out to Capricorn Literary for helping keep books like this alive because I think that is so important for vintage horror to have a longer shelf life because these books they're so hard to find in their original paperback form. So yes, Book of the Damned, so zany, so crazy. Essentially, this girl reads a book called Book of the Damned, and then weird things starts happening. It's almost like she's living scenes from the book within her mind, and it gets pretty crazy. It gets pretty bleak. There's hilarious parts. There is a penis that is used as a lightsaber. That is the th phrase I say every single time I talk about this book. It is wacky. There are giant spiders that like stuff happens that it's really disgusting and oh I really love this book. I do think if you're into vintage horror this book has a great combination of all things that make vintage horror worth reading. Next up we have Walkers by Graham Masterton. This was one of the very first paperbacks from hell 
that I ever read. And it wasn't the very, very first one, but it was definitely up there, like one of the very first ones. And I was so happy to find this in an actual used bookstore. So the cover is freaking awesome. It's like a freaking brick wall strangling this dude. Amazing. Essentially, our main premise is this guy named Jack is drawn to this old decrepit building and he decides he wants to buy it no matter what. It's basically an old sanitarium. But the sanitarium is not what it seems. The empty rooms echo to the soundless screaming of a madman trapped inside the brick and plaster, walking endlessly through the maze that is the oaks. Here ring the terrified shrieks of a little boy, Jack's son, dragged into the hellish prison of the walls, held hostage by Quintus Miller, leader of the insane. Quintus took the killers into the walls. Now he insists Jack Reed will set them free, or his son will die. Honestly, Graham Masterton, if you read any book by him, it would be great and perfectly appropriate for Garb August because his books are out there. This one was a lot of fun. Uh, it had a lot of gruesome passages of people being sucked into sidewalks and stuff. Awesome. Yeah, I really enjoyed this one, but it's been quite a while since I read it. So hopefully if you pick it up, you will enjoy it too. Next, Death Song by Douglas Borton. This book was so out there, but in the best way. It got started with its action, like on page five. A freaking little baby, honestly, gets sacrificed. So if you have a problem with that, I mean, I have a problem with it if it were to happen in real life, but if you have a problem with that in fiction, then I would not read this. Definitely not read this at all. But this is so wild. Essentially, this girl, Billy Lee Kid, she's the only one who could save everyone after she accidentally sings this song known as the Death Song, which gets this cult up and gearing up to help end the world, essentially. There's a lot more to it than that. It's more intricate than I'm making it out to be. But oh my god, I read this in a special paperbacks from hell specific vlog, and I read a passage from it. I'm gonna play it here because the passage was about a song duel. So yes, song duels, like sword fights, or sword duels, yeah, but with songs. That happens in this book. So here we go. Here is me reenacting the song duel that I read about in this book. I see you were expecting me. He said. Not exactly. She tried to smile. I was expecting somebody who could put up a fight. He laughed. Such spirit. I like that. He met her eyes. A duel then? To the death? <laughs> she stared him down. Uh-huh, she said with all the courage she could find. I'm taking you alive. No, my dear, you are not taking me at all. The two songs rose at the same instant and clashed like swords in the summer air. I just like how they describe it, like it's a literal duel, like a sword battle, but they're essentially just singing at each other. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And that dude is all like, Maggots. Everything is maggots. So yeah, this book is amazing. It's ridiculous. It even says here, Billy Lee kept singing, knowing full well that nothing in this world or beyond could save her and all humanity if she hit one wrong note. Death song! <laughs> Next up, The Nest by Gregory A. Douglas. Another book that I've talked about time and time and time again on my channel, but for a good reason. A dude has sex with some leaves. I'm just gonna get it out there and out of the way right away because I always talk about that when I'm talking about this book. That's what makes it trashy is that there's some sex scenes like in the forest and people get devoured by roaches while they're having sex. But one dude in particular doesn't even need nobody else for the sex. He just needs a pile of leaves and then he may or may not get devoured by some roaches. Your penis kiss it goodbye, bitch. It's a, <laughs> the leaves aren't the only thing that is going to get a piece of it. Before the book is through, it's going to be them roaches. And then you're going to be very sorry that you put your dick in the, <laughs> in the leaves. <laughs> Just ignore me. Just ignore me. I'm not usually this crass. But this book, I really love the imagery in this book. I actually think it's written with such wonderful poetic language. This is one of my favorite, favorite animal attack books ever. It's not perfect. There is a little dry section that's very scientific going into detail about why the roaches evolved to be able to 
eats whole humans, bones and all. And so we get a little bit about that, and that might be a little too scientific for some people. However, I really loved it, and the language outside of the scientific part is why I absolutely dug this book so hard. It's just because it was so over the top. In fact, I will play you a clip from my review of The Nest where I did say some quotes that are non-spoiler quotes from the book, and it's still one of my favorite reviews that I've ever done on my booktube channel still to this day, like years later. So here we go. Here are a few quotes from The Nest. The roaches were ready. Suddenly an ice pick stabbed the man in one eye, then the other, so that he never saw what it was he had been calling to in the woods. He crashed down with an expression of amazement and stupefaction that was soon the grin of a skull on a deathbed of crimson leaves. To him, the formation of the roach heads, their eyes, mandible, mouths, gave them the appearance of laughing monsters, monstrosities mocking all the humans. This, he thought, was what the demons of hell must really look like, roaches. Satan himself, a deformed giant roach. No, Satan, no! It's Satan! Not today, Satan. Next up, a book I don't have physically, but I'll show a picture. It is Slimer by Harry Adam Knight. And I just read this this year. There is an audiobook. It's got a British narrator. Not everyone loves British narrators, but I like this particular narrator because he narrated a couple of my old school vintage paperback from hell audiobooks that I've listened to, and I like all of them for some reason. I really just jive with his voice style. And Slimer was ridiculous. There were some really terrible characters that you just hated. It's specifically this one dude who was so, so horrible to his girlfriend that you just wanted him to freaking get it. Essentially, I'm not going to tell you what Slimer is, but these people find themselves lost out in the sea, and they find this empty, abandoned science station, and at first they think it's like a drilling station, so they go up, everything's empty, they see that it's like a science research facility, and there's something amiss. Something's not adding up, and I'll leave it at that. It is kind of vulgar in ways because of the terrible character I mentioned. He's just so out there, and he wants to, like, have sex with, like, every woman there, and so because of that, he is super unlikable, but you're supposed to not like him, so he's supposed to be over the top, so just keep that in mind if you do read it. But yeah, I would say this one I would advise people to be careful even more than some of the other books on my list just because of that one guy. But the story itself, I was entertained and I had a good time. And I do think it was zany and out there and such a weird book. And I was thoroughly entertained, honestly, and that's why it made my list. Another animal attack book lands on my top 20 trashiest paperbacks from hell, and that is Worms by James R. Montague. And this also, luckily, has a newer edition that is available. It also has an audiobook that is available with the same British narrator that narrated Slimer that I just talked about. I liked Worms so much that I had checked it out from the library, but I ended up buying myself a physical copy because I enjoyed it so much. So we do have this guy who goes to the country with his wife, and he ends up looking at a shack and really wanting to buy it. He'd love to have a place in the country, so he wants to convince his wife to help him purchase it, but things go awry between him and his wife. Things go down, and it's pretty bad. He ends up starting to see worms everywhere, and he doesn't know if it's in his mind or if they're real worms. And I gotta say, I love this animal attack book because it's not just your typical animal attack. There is a bigger psychological element to it than most typical animal attack. Most animal attacks, just like the animals are coming for you, you got death scenes, that's it. There's more to this than just that. It's like a lot of guilt that is manifested, and he's like, are, are these even real? And I'll let you find out if the worms are real or not, or if they're just in his imagination. But I had a good time. It does take a little while to get into the story, at least for me personally, it took me a little while, because the arguing between the husband and wife was a little jarring and hard to read just because the wife was so mean and so unlikable but he was also kind of mean in a way because he was sick of her but I don't blame him because if she really was like that or if there was a lady like that I'd be sick of her too so I understood how he felt about her but yeah that part was just a little hard to read but once you get into the bigger part of the story like the mid to ending of the story it's great I loved it lots going on and uh the main character was just wacky and I was like oh gosh he's getting it himself into some shit now. So I, I enjoyed it. Very different, fun animal attack book. Yep, another animal attack book lands on my list. This is Black Cat by John Russo, and this one is 
freaking wacky and weird. We do have some kind of hoodoo voodoo elements going on in terms of some kind of magical elements. It's just not about a big black cat or a you know, small black cat. You might be thinking like a house cat. No, no, no. It's about like a big black panther type of cat. And in this story, it's used to represent these men get binded like almost like it's their spirit animal and they feel like they can embody the panther and so stuff develops from there there's lots going on in this story it's way more than just that that doesn't give anything away that's just the tip of the iceberg in terms of what the story goes into and uh it's definitely an entertaining time in terms of a different take on animal attack i know i keep saying that but the reason i put these animal attack books on here is because they're there's something a little bit different or a little bit unique about each of them next Next up, Pin by Andrew Niederman, and I do believe this was on Alex, the Bookubus's list, so check out her channel once again, the Bookubus, she's fabulous. Pin by Andrew Niederman, it is so out there. Incest, of course, incest is in a lot of vintage horror, I don't know why, but it does pop up in quite a lot of older paperback books, especially horror books, and it is what it is, whatever. In this book, it's very, very disturbing. We've got a brother and sister. Their relationship definitely doesn't seem normal. They're just chilling with each other without their clothes on sometimes, and they've got this doll, and this doll named Pin, he's anatomically correct, and the father, as they were growing up, used the doll to teach the brother and sister, his children, about the birds and the bees. But one of them becomes a little too reliant on Pin and actually thinks of him as a real entity and starts talking with him. Is Pin real? What is going on? Why is one or both of the kids obsessed with Pin and can't get over this attachment to Pin? And how will they lead normal adult lives? It's very creepy. I would say it's more of a slow burn. It's more about the off-putting relationships within the story and that gives it the creepy factor, but it's definitely appropriate for Garbogus because there are definitely some trashy elements. Number one trashy element is definitely the incest part of the story, where the brother and sister just seem a little bit too cozy with each other. Next up, I'm going to recommend the trashiest book that I've read by Richard Lehman, but really you could put any Richard Lehman book in this book's place, and it would be appropriate for Garbogus, and it would also be trashy, because Richard Lehman is the king of trash, and I say that without any respect or honor, because in a lot of cases, I'm like, oh, oh I say trash in a good way, but when you're talking about Richard Lehman, and I'm not trying to be super mean about Richard Lehman, because I love his books, because to me, they're trashy cozy, but you could almost say trash in a negative way with Richard Lehman, because he does over-sexualize all of his characters, a lot of people hate that about his books, and I understand. I'm somebody who, for some reason, I can't even explain it myself, I enjoy his work. I enjoy the craziness. I enjoy the bonkers plots and where his books go and just how far out there he goes with his books and how despite going so far out there people still loved his books for the most part i mean that's why he was so popular back in the day especially he was even more popular like overseas than in america so i think that's kind of interesting but the book i'm highlighting here specifically would be the seller and it's actually a series of books but the seller is the first one in the series and yeah you won't believe what's actually in the cellar so basically we do have this crazy guy who gets out of prison and he's gonna go after his daughter and wife and it's horrible what he wants to do to his daughter that is disturbing in itself and that's another reason why a lot of people don't like richard layman it's because of the adult men characters and sometimes like how they act towards younger female characters and this is one of those cases where it's super uncomfortable and lots of like sexual violence like is being talked about and thought about and sometimes even occurring which is really hard to read and I will say I struggle with those parts of these books too but what's crazy is what ends up being in the cellar. So the woman and the child end up going to this small town where there is like this house, I believe it's called Beast House. Yeah, and tourists flock there because it's notorious for people being killed by the quote beast, including the woman's family. And then she shows off the house to people, the tourists who come by to see it. And it's all very weird all very shady, and uh, what is really in the house? What really makes it the Beast House? Is there a creature there or something more? What does it want? What's it doing there? What it turns out to be, like I said, is just gonna blow your mind, and it's super trashy. It's uber trashy. It's the most laymanist of layman books ever, if that makes sense. It's the most Richard Layman book to have ever Richard Layman. That's what I want to say. It 
is freaking out there bonkers. Yeah, full-blown Richard Lehman at the end. And I'm here for it, honestly. If you can brave the freaking trashiness of his books, then take the dive and try it out. But look up trigger warnings and don't go in lightly and don't go in just because I recommended it to you. Be sure you really see if it's for you before you dive in. And don't blame it on me because I warned you. I warned you. Next up, I could not mention a Ruby Jean Jensen book. I've read quite a few books by her, but some of them are a little slow paced. I picked the most gruesome of the books I've read by her thus far. This one has the most gore. It actually has like this crazy scene where the police discover this body and it's so gruesome. So ever since I read this, this was my first Ruby Jean Jensen, I've been a little let down by the gore in her other books because this one went so ham. But yeah, this is The Reckoning and there are these mysterious children who've been missing for years who just start being seen around town. And they look the same, and they're wearing the same clothes as they were when they went missing originally. So something's not right about these kids. And then people start dying around the town. So is it being caused by the kids? All this death and mayhem? I don't know. You'll have to read it and see. <laughs> I mean, I do know. You don't know, and I don't want to tell you. So Night of the Children, the Earth Below the Revival Tent shook, bringing Pastor Walsh's meeting to a close. Was this some mysterious force that God had unleashed in response to his preaching? And how could anyone explain the sudden appearance and disappearance of Patrick, the youth suspected of murder, who had been missing for more than a year at the back of the tent? Then, later that night, there were other sightings of lost children. Lost, forgotten children that had not been seen in years, strangely unchanged from the day they disappeared. Whatever dark secrets the town had preserved the time had finally come for the reckoning so this was a really good ruby jean jensen book i gave it a 3.5 so not the most highest rated book on my list that i've you know been recommending to you guys but i do think it's worth reading i feel like ruby jean jensen if you want to get into vintage horror she's someone you have to read and look her freaking picture is so cute she's like a cute little grandma i love her so you don't think that she would be writing about gruesome stuff but she did write about gruesome stuff. Look at her. Oh, she's so cute. Anyway, I just love her author photo because she looks so innocent, but she wrote about some pretty gnarly things, especially in this book, in my opinion. Next up, you're probably sick of me recommending you guys animal attack books, but it is another animal attack book, and this one is Slugs by Sean Hudson, and this one is pretty gross. There's something that happens, a specific scene at a restaurant that is really disgusting that has stayed with me and I will remember that scene forever unfortunately because it's very very gross. So if you want a gross out type of animal attack book I think Slugs is for you because yeah it goes there it goes there especially in certain scenes throughout the book. To me it did take a little bit to get started so it doesn't press the gas pedal right away so you got to give it some time but when the gruesome scenes appear they go pretty hardcore and it's it's pretty graphic so I do think that this is a good animal attack book and I didn't want to make a top 20 list without mentioning it. I do want to clarify before we go any further that this is my top 20 trashiest paperback from hell list not my top 20 favorite paperback from hell list that I've ever read. We're not going to be including books that are more sophisticated like freaking The Auctioneer, or The Cipher by Kathy Koja, or Harvest Home, which is a super slow burn and a very, very good, well-written horror novel. These books are trashy, in my opinion, but I mean trashy with mostly respect, in that they're fun, they're zany, and they're appropriate for Garbogus. That's why I'm making this specific list. I will have a top 20, you know, overall favorite paperback from hell book list later. I already have that made up, but uh, it will include some of these books, perhaps, but a lot of other paperback books that do not fit into the, you know, purely trashy, zany, crazy category like these books do. Next book that makes the list is Ghost Train by Stephen Laws, and I just listened to this on audio not very long ago, back in May of 2023, and the climax of this book is the reason why it lands on this list. There's a crazy climax with dudes battling it out on a train with, like, demonic forces, it seems like, and yeah, it's marvelous. It's wonderful. Let me just read you the back of the book so you can get the gist of the overall story. 
It was another day in hell. It always began this way, ever since Mark had fallen from the rushing train, surrounded by a swirl of purple fog. Every day was a day in hell, haunted by dreams filled with fear, urged again and ever again to return to the train station. Davis is caught in a maelstrom of nightmares and voices and something struggling to control him. And there is something there, something of the train, something strong enough to drive men to murder, to steal children to kill, something reveling in death. There is something riding the train and it wants to be free. Until it is, there is only hell for Mark, whether he lives or dies. Ah, 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 ah. So yeah, some parts are a little bit slow, but the climax is why you want to read it, and overall, a very entertaining read for the most part. The other king of trash, in my opinion, is William W. Johnstone, so we're going to talk about him now. I am officially putting Toy Cemetery on this top 20 craziest, trashiest list, but really you could put any William W. Johnstone book here because they're all kind of outrageous and poorly written. So I say trash in a bad way, sometimes in regards to Layman, but all the time in regards to William W. Johnstone. So I gotta, I gotta say, his books are a little out there in terms of I mean, I don't even understand how they sold so well because of the way they were written. Uh, this one, Toy Cemetery by him, I have so many tabs in this one because it was one of the first books that I ever read that was like a paperback from hell book. So it was early on in my paperback from hell journey. And it's the first book I ever vlogged. So, and my freaking puzzlement at some of the plot turns in this book was just hilarious to witness. So I have a lot of different tabs for the ridiculous quotes. And sometimes I marked the bad writing. I'm actually going to be doing a video later in August called Kelsey Quotes William W. Johnstone because I have read three books by him, including Toy Cemetery. And yeah, they all have some ridiculous quotes that are just really terrible, uh, especially when it comes to these absurd sex scenes he writes. But yes, this one, I gotta say, Toy Cemetery, it's the most wild of all the ones I've read by him so far. And it's hard to find, it's rare, but now you can find it on Kindle. So that is a good thing if you're willing to take a risk and read something that is utter trash, literal trash, then go ahead and pick it up. But it is fun, I gotta say. It's so out there and bad that it's almost good, if that makes sense. It's like Troll 2, but in book form. Here's just an example of the terrible writing where he literally has the characters say each other's name like every other line. So it says, the girl suddenly turned and stalked out of the room. The others followed her. Robert slammed the door behind him. I have always been inadequate in explaining death, Eric. No one really knows what lies behind the dark curtain, Pat. Strange words from you, Eric. Realistic words, Pat. You did what you had to do and explained it as best you could. Now it's time to go to work. We've been together a long time, Eric. This will be our most difficult battle. I can sense it. We'd better get busy then, Pat. We have a lot to do. So, just like you could see, why did he use their names for every single line there? I don't know. People don't talk like that. People don't talk like that. But it makes for an entertaining time. But here's the premise. And I will say, there's a little bit of a lack of toys in this book, even though it is called Toy Cemetery. That is one my one big gripe with this book. But I guess you could have a lot of gripes with this book. The subject matter of this is also disturbing. Like, kids and adults, sexual attraction, it happens in this book. I'll just read you the back. Toyland. There they were, just as he remembered. Rooms and rooms of them. Dolls. Toy soldiers. Clowns. When he was a kid, his Aunt Carrie's toy collection should have been a child's paradise. But instead, he had been terrified by their staring eyes and limp arms. Toy hell. Twenty years had passed since Jay set foot in Victory, Missouri. Twenty years of trying to forget that night. The hellish night of unimaginable horror. Now his aunt was dead, and it's all been left to him. The house, the furniture, every last piece of her collection. And nothing had changed, not the painted on dolly smiles or the garish clown colors or the tiny hands that were dripping with bright red blood. Toy Cemetery. There is like a child sex ring in this book. It's not like shown, but like it's talked about. So I will warn you on that. It's not really a spoiler, but the back of the book makes it seem like it's more about toys when there's some more deeper nefarious things in this book than just that. So yes, this is wacky. This is wild. And it's also really bad, but it had to make my trashiest top 20 list, of course. Next up, we've got Wet Bones by John Shirley. I really, really like this book quite a lot. I think it's actually very well written, but it does lean into splatterpunk in terms of with its gore. It's very, very gory. It's very graphic. Essentially, these people find out that they control 
other people's pain and pleasure centers with their minds. And so because they can do that, they're able to manipulate other people to do what they want. And there's a lot more to it than that, but that's the basic gist of it. I think it's a very entertaining book. It also has an audiobook, so that is a plus. And yeah, I think it's a good time. Next up, I almost feel bad putting this on the list because I think this is actually way more elevated in terms of writing style than a lot of the others. This is Familiar Spirit by Lisa Tuttle. Lisa Tuttle is amazing. I am not calling her writing trash, but I gotta be honest that some of the story elements in this book are a little trashy. There is this haunted house and this woman moves in after a bad breakup and she starts experiencing things. And there's also animal cruelty, so beware about that. Some cats get hurt, so beware if you're very sensitive about that. But yeah, something happens with the stone statue near the end. It's definitely trashy. And for basically that reason and a couple of other reasons, this lands on the list. But I loved every second of this book. It was marvelous, and I had a great time. And so far, I think it's one of my favorite reads of the year. It, it was so, so entertaining. And so I think it's a good read with trashy elements, if that makes sense. But I had to mention it here because I do think it's a great read, especially for those looking for Pearbacks from Hell, specifically for Garb August. Next up, we have Falling Angel by William Horchisberg. I don't know how to say it. I'm terrible at pronunciation, but it's spelled H-J-O-R-T-S-B-E-R-G. And this is such a good book. It's also got some elevated writing to it, but there is some crazy stuff in the book in terms of a specific scene near the end is pretty out there. And the reveal at the end is insane. There is a movie based on this that stars Robert De Niro, but the book is much better in my opinion. So definitely check out the book, even if you've seen the movie already. And I think the book, the reveal is worth it alone. And that kind of what's is what makes it trashy a little bit, and also the scene that happens in the train station at the end. So the essential plot of the story, we're following this detective named Harry Angel, of course, which is kind of funny because Falling Angel, haha, ha, get it, yes. The name is a little cheesy, but yes. The detective's name's Harry Angel, and he gets hired to try to find out where this guy is, and what this guy's been up to, and these grisly murders that seem to have like a voodoo element to them and why they're happening. So he's basically investigating for a lot of the book, but the climax is definitely crazy and out there and was my favorite part of the book. So I had to name it here because yeah, there are some trashy elements in this book for sure, but it is a wonderful book. All right, last official book on my list is Nelfs by Sydney Williams. And if you only take one of my suggestions, I think it should be this one. So if you're only gonna go away from this video with one thing in your mind, just remember Nelfs by Sydney Williams, it's amazing. I'm gonna get it over with now. There are these cartoon creatures who basically harass this little girl named Heaven. Somehow these fictional cartoon characters come to life basically badger and hurt, physically are able to hurt heaven, but not only do they do all of that, they also specifically for some reason happen to keep bashing verbally heaven's mom to heaven. They're like, yo, your mom's a bitch, your mom's a whore. For some reason, they keep saying this over and over again to heaven, and heaven's like, no, why? Why? Why are you saying this to me? So it's sad, poor little heaven. But anyway, the things that develop in this book, marvelous, out there, best book on this list in terms of enjoyment factor. I think of all the books on this list, a person who doesn't like horror very much could pick this up and enjoy it. I know people who don't always love vintage horror. My friend Katrina over at the channel Katrina Brown and my friend Amy from Amy Noel Reads, they read this book based on my suggestion, by the way, and they both gave it five stars, baby. So yes, entertainment factor. It has it. It definitely has it. And I don't mean just because the Nelts are funny. There is an audiobook which adds a lot of humor to everything, especially because it's a man and he's narrating the voice of the little girl heaven, plus the cartoon characters, plus the mom. You do have to give the book about 10 to 15 percent because the mom has all these internal worries and anxieties about not being a good mom. And that's a little annoying because it's just very basic worries at the beginning of the book where it doesn't feel... I don't know, like super engrossing right away. But then once the plot develops and we learn more about the Nelfs and wondering what they're doing, and once we, you know, learn about why they're doing what they're doing, then it gets great. And the ending is marvelous. So I can't say enough good things about this book. I've been preaching it a lot this year and touting it left and right, but that's for a good reason because it is super fun, super entertaining, and perfect for Garb August, of course. 
All right, and that was technically my top 20, but let me give you two honorable mentions before we go. One is a paperback from hell officially, in terms of it was released, you know, 70s, 80s, 90s. The other is not, because it was released in the early 2000s, and it's a different kind of book, but I'm still going to mention it here because it would be perfect to read, because there is a week where you can read movie novelizations and movie tie-ins, and it would fit within that week, but I also kind of lump it in with Paperbacks from Hell. We'll get there in a second. First, the actual book that you can consider a paperback from hell, Joyride by Stephen Cry. This one's hard to find. You can't find it on Kindle, but you can find it on archive.org. Archive.org, again, that's where you can find it and read it on your computer if you do not have a physical copy. This is an old school slasher book, and it is a great slasher book. Not all slasher books are good. Some of them fail miserably, but this one, it's got amazing kills. These group of teenagers, they wander into the, t the killer's territory, and they get picked off one by one, but the killer isn't your typical you know, meaningless killer, we do actually get his backstory, which I think this, you know, this element in this book makes that a little bit different than your typical slasher. So to me, it's like an elevated slasher, which seems weird to put it as an honorable mention on the trashy list, but slashers are kind of trashy in general. So I had to recommend, I think, one of the best old school vintage slasher books, which again is Joyride. And the other book, which technically is not a paperback from hell, it was published in 2006, and it is a Friday the 13th tie-in book. It is called The Jason Strain, and it is by Krista Faust, and this is also super hard to find. In fact, if you go to used bookstores and you ever see this book out in the wild, you should snag it, because these old Friday the 13th novelization or media tie-in books are so rare and they go for tons of money online. So these are very expensive to acquire online. I wouldn't just go looking for them. Where you can listen to this book is you go to the YouTube channel, the Slash Tracks Network, and that is an amazing YouTube channel that has made a lot of old school slasher books and old school movie tie-in books available in audio format. The guy who runs the channel is freaking awesome. I will link the channel down below. It is well worth your time. And freaking the Jason Strain goes freaking haywire in terms of story. It's uber trashy but it's written by a woman so that kind of gives it this awesome element where you think she's kind of trying to make a statement because there is a lot of talk about boobs and women's bodies but it's almost like she's saying it ironically like oh Hollywood cares too much about this stuff because that's how it's discussed within the story there is a reality show on an island where it's like all these freaking people who are on death row battle and they freaking they, they toss Jason into the mix yes Jason from Friday the 13th and at one point does Jason battle a shark yes and that is what makes it uber trashy and perfect for Garbogus it is a really good story and I actually think the character development is awesome so even though I'm saying that it's perfect for Garb August and good trash, I actually think it's good as in elevated trash because there are some really enticing characters and you can sympathize with them and empathize with them. And so to me, that makes it a little bit, you know, more sophisticated type of trash than your usual everyday trash. And I kind of, I personally lump in these kind of movie tie-ins from the early 2000s with paperbacks from hell. I don't know why, it's not really an official thing, but I just lumped them all together. So I'm mentioning it here because, I don't know, I think it'd be a great pick for Garb August. I've been obsessed with it since I read it in June. Okay, guys, as usual, that was long-winded as hell, but for this time, that is it for me. Thank you guys so much for giving me your time. You know I appreciate it every single time you join me for any of my videos. If it's your first time here, please consider subscribing. It would mean the world to me. My channel is my baby. I really love it. I put a lot of heart into it, and I appreciate you guys giving me your time to check out this video and any of my other videos if you are a returning viewer. Thank you so much. Like I said, though, that is it. Till next time, guys, you know what you can do. Keep on killing it and get trashy for Garbogus.